The Big Loop, combination of the Shoal Creek Trail, the Water Creek Trail, and the Lance Armstrong Bikeway, as well as the Trail Conservancy's Butler Trail along the south side. That 30 plus mile loop would uh, represent the bulk of the urban core of Austin. And its funding of its creation is, exists now with the passage of 2020 bond. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns Journal. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is Ted Siff, one of the founding members of the Austin Outside uh, Membership Organization, which is a coalition of other uh, organizations throughout the Austin area, striving to enhance the quality of life for Austinites uh, by giving them access to trails and pathways and open space and parklands. Uh, this is a fabulous conversation that I've been dying to get uh, recorded. And so without further ado, Here's Ted Siff. Ted Siff, it's an absolute honor to have you in the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. My pleasure to be here. <laughs> Ted, uh, so you and I know each other. We're, we're both here in the Austin area, uh, but my audience, they may not know who you are. So Ted, take this opportunity to just uh, uh, briefly introduce yourself. Well, thanks, John. It's a uh... First of all, pleasure to be with you. And I uh, have, as an adult, primarily done two things. I've earned a living mainly through publishing, but a good chunk of my adult life, I've been an advocate for open space and active transportation. In the late 80s, I helped found with a group of others here in Austin, a nonprofit called Citizens for Open Space. That led to ultimately the creation of the Texas Office of the Trust for Public Land, which I headed for a decade in the 90s. And during the 90s, um, two things happened largely at the impetus of Trust for Public Land activities, the creation of the Austin Parks Foundation, which I went on to be the executive director of for five years from 99 to 04. Uh, and then to earn a li living, I've been back doing uh, publishing stuff, but as a volunteer, Park and Active Transportation Advocate have helped create uh, two su substantial nonprofits. One, the Shoal Creek Conservancy, and I know you've had its ex executive director, Ivy Kaiser, on your program. And uh, then the coalition of open space and active transportation advocates called Austin Outside, which I'm on the board of, and uh, it's uh, my probably primary activity right now as a as an advocate. Yeah, and let's pull up the timeline here because you sent this over, and I think this is a, a great way to put a visual to this. Is yeah, that timeline. Uh, you had mentioned something, you know. In, in the 80s leading up to this. And yes, that's awesome. I've also had a representative from the Trust for Public Land on the, the, the podcast as well. Uh, the audio only version. So I need to bring her back on and, uh, and, and do the video version to really bring it to life. But yeah, this is, I love this history because, uh, you know, we, we didn't get here to the Austin area until the fall of 2014. And then I met you, you know, soon after that. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's wonderful to have this context, and we'll talk a little bit about you know that history of of how this has kind of you know come to life and all of that. But take us back to the 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 nineties. What were some of the main issues that that the city was dealing with that really prompted some of this activity? Uh, sure, it sounds almost cliche at this point, but growth was the major issue of the eighties. It has happened to be the major issue of the 90s and the aughts and the 2020s too. Austin has been a, a fast growing city almost since its founding 150-ish years ago. But in the 80s in, in particular, the risk to the water quality of the jewel of Austin, Barton Springs, brought to head uh, advocates to against development in the Southwest sector of the city and uh, that led to a citizen initiative uh, ordinance proposition on a 1992 city ballot that limited growth in the Southwest sector. That's called the Save Our Springs Ordinance. 
on that same ballot, and at least as importantly from my point of view, there were two bond propositions, one for $22 million to fund acquisition of land for endangered species protection, but uh, the other, a $20 million bond proposition to fund land to uh, fund land acquisition in the Barton Springs watershed, Barton Creek watershed to protect Barton Springs. And uh, I was involved in those two bond propositions largely, uh, along with a host of others to advocate for something that had been advocated uh, by other citizens over decades before, that is acquiring the land above Barton Springs uh, to protect it from uh, water quality degradation, but also just to protect the whole watershed, the ecosystem of that watershed that happily happened as a result of the passage of that $20 million bond proposition, uh, where now we have a thousand acre park at the headwaters uh, or at, at, at upstream from Barton Springs. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I have to, to pull this photo up because this, this brings us back to that sort of that era. This is from uh, 1992, I believe, or actually maybe 93 even. Um, but uh, yeah, so you, you've been in this fight for a while. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't, you know, it's, it's a quest. It's a challenge. It's, it, I don't know if a fight is the right terminology to use. But well, public the, interest, uh, efforts uh, don't go away. And uh, to feel now or realize now that it's been decades is actually a pleasure not not at all otherwise and uh, uh, it's made a bit of a difference yeah yeah and and you know it's funny too because uh completely unplanned but uh, you know last week i had gary merritt on from the, the great springs project Right. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's not a new idea. Uh, <clears throat> the Boston Common was created by those citizens uh, several hundred years ago to have a common area for, for folks and one that hosted uh, the cattle of that village, but also the people to gather and, and uh, recreate as well as just uh, uh, share ideas. In Central Texas, we've got the natural resources that are, are here that citizens feel very strongly about and the great springs project is what uh, is the is the current representation of that public interest effort that is expressed by citizens throughout central texas uh, i was lucky enough to lead citizen interests for open space but also active transportation through the trust for public land in the great state of texas for that decade of the 90s and Part of it, I would just draw out of this that in 94, right after the passage of the newest Federal Transportation Act, which at that time was called the Inner Surface Modal Transportation Efficiency Act, ICE-T, there was money for transportation enhancements, what we saw as money for trails. And so part of our open space effort was to provide citizen access to that open space through bikeways and sidewalks and, and trails. And uh, so a, another citizen nonprofit effort called the Austin Metropolitan Trails Council was formed largely to advocate to get some of that federal money from for the Austin region. And we were quite successful in doing that. But uh, as a result, we had uh, also to document the citizen interest and need mainly ground truth by people getting out there and walking largely along creeks. We uh, created the vision for a 400 mile network of primarily creek based uh, trails that all connected through the Colorado River, which runs through Austin because all of those creeks flow into the Colorado River. Yeah. I'm going to pull up this timeline again because I, th I think this is uh, helpful to sort of, uh, you know, capture some of what you just said as well. And the fact that, yes, uh, a lot of this land and park space that is is being conserved and preserved 
is also being activated through active mobility. And then we do see that sort of blending of, of active recreation as well as active mobility. It's not just uh, preserving and, and putting under glass, uh, you know, the open space. There is a time and place for some of that as well. But in, in most of these cases, we're, we're seeing a, a real passion for, for activating the space. And uh, some of the things that, that I'm seeing here, one of the things I'm honing in on is in 1996, the Trail Dogs Coalition was formed. Uh, talk a little bit about the Trail Dogs and what it is that you were really hoping to do with that. And who the heck are the Trail Dogs? Uh, sure. Th- thanks for honing in on that. Uh, you know, it, there's a logical evolution, at least from my perspective. We First, in the late 80s, early 90s, a group of citizens came together to say, we're citizens for open space. We don't have anything against the houses we live in or the other buildings around, but there are some special places that should not be built upon. And with the Federal Transportation ICT passage in 91, actually, that also led to the concept of this open space could be connected by bike lanes or sidewalks or, or, or even uh, creek-based trails. That uh, city of Austin bond set of bond propositions in '92 was passed. In '94, a group of nonprofits, uh, the Austin Parks Foundation, had been founded that year. But there was also an effort to protect the trail that existed uh, for a couple of decades prior around uh, what at that time was called Town Lake, now Lady Bird Lake, the center of the city. So there, there was a clutch of, of people and organizations that wanted to focus on getting some of that federal trail and active transportation money out of that federal bill. So that formed a loose coalition, not unincorporated group of nonprofits that first advocated for city grants to the feds for uh, federal money. But also in 94, it looked like there might be a new city bond election opportunity that actually happened in 96. And in it, there was uh, the first bond city bond money for trails. Yeah. And I think that's represented right here. And closing the, the loop on that is is we've got active transportation bonds and then also the, uh, the, the open space bonds also in 1996 there. And then... A few years later, in 2013, the Shoal Creek Conservancy was founded. And as you mentioned, I had I- Ivy Kaiser uh, on as a guest talking about the the, the Shoal Creek Conservancy. And uh, what a great, you know, example of, you know, this concept of a, you know, Creekside trail system. And uh, we talked a little bit about the, the this concept of the need in in the Austin area for foundations and conservancies. But why don't you give your sort of take on this? Because in 1993, when the Austin Parks Foundation was was founded, uh, you, you were a board member. You were also the executive director for a time. Why the heck does Texas and why the heck does Austin need a parks foundation? Uh, we have an international audience. They might be going, well, why do you need these NGOs, nonprofits, public private partnerships to try to fund what ultimately should be funded by the government? So give a little context as to why this is necessary. Uh, sure. And a pu- public interest advocacy generally represented through in the United States. IRS code 501c3 that establishes the ability to donate money to organizations and have a tax deduction through that donation. That's the independent sector, if you will. There's the private sector that develops land for private profit, at least in the United States, and there's the public sector, the governmental sector. But the manifestation of citizen interest, public interest, is largely uh, represented if it's organized through nonprofits, some of which getting into the weeds a little bit can be tax deductible, some of which if it's stronger advocacy and involved in electing people, that's not 
tax deductible. Those are uh, different kinds of nonprofits. But uh, just uh, focus on the Austin Parks Foundation and the Shoal Creek Conservancy, two examples of citizen nonprofits that have basically said, we respect the public sector effort to get parks in Austin or to protect the Shoal Creek Trail and Shoal Creek itself. But we citizens think, first of all, the, the public sector should do more. And we're going to ad- articulate that need through forming a nonprofit to raise money and, and uh, be a public voice, collective voice for this public asset. But also, if necessary, raise private money to enhance this particular part of the public sector's activities by special donations. So uh, that independent sector exists in many areas. I've pretty much focused on open space and active transportation in my adult life, uh, largely for the Austin area. But uh, it's just being an active citizen. And uh, every there's... Nobody need, at least in the United States, to ask anybody's permission. We have that right to articulate our view of the public interest. And uh, collectively, that ultimately, if successful, generates some positive results. Yeah. I was shocked when I got here. Austin, on a per capita basis, is pretty good in terms of the amount of public land and parks that is available. But it's in the bottom three to five percent the last time I checked in terms of per capita funding for, for, in other words, the city's budget to actually be able to maintain and operate and build new infrastructure is one of the worst in the nation. It's, I was astounded, especially because this has been an area of tremendous growth and there's so much wealth and industry in this area. And yet we need to have the public, you know, the, the Austin Parks Foundation. We need to have the Shoal Creek Conservancy. We need to have the the Trail Foundation, which is now called the, the Trail Conservancy. Yeah, it's like part of the reason why we need these things is because we need to, to bridge the gap in a lack of funding. Is this a Texas thing? Is, is this a, a challenge that, you know, even the Dallas Metroplex area is is you know, challenged with, I, I was astounded by learning that, that there was this huge funding gap. Yeah, it, it may be, uh, to some degree, a uh, cultural Texas thing. I, I would say the first reason for these, any of these nonprofits that you mentioned to exist is to articulate exactly what you just said, the need for more public funding. And uh, there's competition in terms of the allocation of public funds, whether it be for roads or hospitals or uh, social welfare. There, there are things that may, may be higher priority in terms of the public needs for allocation of funds than parks and recreation. But as, as we've developed the advocacy on the independent sector side in, in Austin, n- noting that open space opportunities and active transportation opportunities are part of our health resilience. We actually have, if you measure, uh, take any number of measurements in Austin, a healthier community than any other uh, Texas urban area. And uh, I would argue that that difference in Austin's overall health, at least to some degree, is because of the the open space and active transportation assets we've put in place over the last several decades. But it is a need, and I'm I don't, not, not sure why we're not better than others, but, but uh, we need to do better, absolutely. Well, it's just, it's a curious fact, and it's one of the reasons why I think that it, it's so imperative that uh, citizens such as yourself are engaged in saying, look, we have this need. There is this gap. We need to be able to do a better job of funding these things. And y'all are not afraid of saying, let's communicate this need. Let's be clear on this. Let's give a, a, a paint a picture and tell a story as to the advantages of doing this. And then 
putting it out to the voters and being able to say, you know, hey, we we do need to dip into our own pockets. We do need to, uh, quote unquote, (laughs) you know, tax ourselves to be able to do this. This is a list of all the different parks and open space and active transportation bond elections that have taken place, you know, from 1992 all the way through the 2020 bond that that took place. I mean, we're we're talking about (laughs) nearly this is one point seven uh one six uh you know billion dollars this is amazing right we've been successful on the capital project side that is the buying of land the the building and improving of uh, park assets the allocation of dollars for active transportation as you know the capstone of that list is the 460 million dollars that was approved by almost uh, over 70 percent of Austin voters in November of 2020 for sidewalks, bike lanes, and trails. Austin had had has done uh, a pretty good job over the last uh, 10 to 20 years in terms of uh, particularly the last decade in developing uh, aspirationally what the bike net network and sidewalk network should be. This funds at least the highest and high priorities of that network and should be spent over the next, the rest of this decade. If that happens, Austin will be competitive with some of the other leading cities in terms of active transportation facilities. Globally, by the way. We are, yeah, well, good. Uh, you said it, not me. I did. And I hope that's true uh, with the coalition and without this Austin Outside Coalition that now is over 60 members. And these are nonprofits as well as for-profit organizations like I'm proud to say the American Health Association chapter in Austin, as well as several architecture and landscape architecture firms are member organizations of Austin Outside that had championed uh, getting that $460 million bond proposition on the ballot with leadership um, from the city council, particularly council member Paige Ellis, who's an absolute leader in this area. That bond proposition would not have happened without her leadership, but to have the have her back, 60 organizations were also saying, yes, this is needed. And uh, so, so once the capital w- was authorized by voters, the, the next step, the next year in the spring of 21, the same coalition advocated for an operating budget amendment to fund 50, that's five zero additional full-time uh, staff to start building these sidewalks and running the projects to do bike lanes and trails. Without that additional staff capacity and operating budget element, the $460 million wouldn't have gotten onto the ground, but I'm happy to report that it's happening right now. Look out, other cities, Austin is going to be competing with you uh, by the end of this decade. Yeah, well, and, and it's and it's taken, uh, as you mentioned, a, a good decade uh, in the last decade of really starting to hone in to fund specifically the build out of the the bike network, which includes many of the off street networks of trails and pathways, in addition to the fact that uh, in the last decade, what is a bike lane, what is acceptable and what is uh, best in class has also changed. Back in the old days, in the in the 90s or whatever, you know, a bike lane was just considered, you know, a four inch amount of paint on a shoulder and, you know, voila, there you go. Well, we found out that pretty much only confident, mainly white males <laughs> took advantage of that. Uh, that's not an all ages and abilities uh, network. Uh, we've learned a lot since then. You mentioned uh, council member Paige Ellis. Uh, she was part of a coalition of group that went to the Netherlands in 2019 to really you know, breathe it in and feel it and, and understand it. 
And uh, as she reminded me, uh, coincidentally, while she was there in in the Netherlands, uh, Austin outside and the coalitions were starting to to come together to, to really put together that framework or that, you know, basically what what was needed to be able to to push that bond forward and it was no small feat i mean this is 2020 the november election it was both uh proposition a which was the project connect the transit uh bond as well as this active transportation bond uh, proposition b and i was absolutely delighted to see both of them pass with very very impressive margins Yes, they actually complemented each other, although all uh, advocates on either side propositions were somewhat con- concerned that they might be competing against each other. Just the opposite turned out to be the case. The active transportation proposition actually led, uh, did several points better in terms of the vote, which leads to the argument that at least active transportation folks were making, which is that uh, if we bring any more voters to the uh, the ballot booth, they're going to vote for both, not just one. Yeah, and and here's here's the the on the Austin Outside web website. Uh, here's the uh, the post of uh, that you know kind of walks out you know what Proposition B was all about, and again, sixty seven percent of the vote, uh, very very impressive. And and to my point that that I was making earlier, it's like. This this is something that needs to really be highlighted is that we, the voters, have decided to invest in this. It's like the, the money is, quote unquote, not there. So we're going to tax ourselves to be able to fund this. And why? Because it is important. It's vitally important that we have access to open space. It's vitally important that we have access to safe and inviting active mobility options. And so it's, I think it's just really, really uh, speaks, uh, you know, quite positively and loudly to the fact that people are getting it. The voters are actually understanding how imperative and how important this is. Yeah. And I just, just put a, a even stronger emphasis on it. Some people might say, well, that's going to hurt growth just the opposite. That is, as the city, as the city of Austin and region, Central Texas region has gained more population, the support for open space and trails and bike lanes and sidewalks has in, increased. They actually complement each other and are complementary to each other because if you've got a whole bunch of tall buildings or even just big apartment complexes or master plan communities, uh, particularly you see it in suburban master plan communities. There isn't one that's planned today that isn't got sidewalks and bike lanes. And if it's near a water course, it's got a trail too on it because those are public amenities that um, that sell homes. Yeah, well, and, 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 and to uh, your point, one of the great examples that we have here in Austin is, of course, the uh, the Miller neighborhood, Mueller, if you prefer that pronunciation, (laughs) the old airport location, which, uh, you know, features because they were able to build a community, a neighborhood from the ground up of what used to be runways. They were able to do it in a, you know, a much more urban, new urbanism sort of context, but then also include a network of trails and pathways and protected bikeways, as well as narrow uh, traffic calmed, low speed neighborhood streets. Uh, you you've watched that you know come together. You know how how amazing has that been to be able to see that come together in the last couple of decades? Right in Forsyth, there were particular city, uh, city council members. Uh, Beverly Griffith at the time was the advocate of making sure the city held the uh, competition for how uh, the private sector developer to partner with the city to do that to very high standards. And that's played out to create one of the many great neighborhoods in Austin. And uh, I'm not one who rolls up the fences at night. That is anybody who's watching this from outside of Austin and wants to come, you're welcome. And there's uh, a lot of great choices in terms of uh, uh, having a wonderful life here. 
Well, and what's what what I love about it is I think that this is helping to make the case for some of our uh, older neighborhoods, older than than Miller per se, of saying, you know, wait, this is kind of cool. I like this protected, you know, bikeway concept and and we should really, you know, strive to, to have some of this active mobility. We want our kids and our grandkids to be able to, to get to school and to be able to get to uh, the parks and to be able to visit with friends. And, you know, in, in many cases, the grandparents want to be with the grandkids and want to feel like it's a safe environment uh, for them to walk and bike and, and be able to use trail networks and, and protected bikeways. So I think that that's I think it's wonderful that we have we can point to an example of, you know, hey, you could have this, too. We just need to do some adjustments and we need to uh, to activate some some of these rights of way that might be sitting dormant. I'm thinking of some of the old rail trail corridors that are rail corridors that exist, especially down the Bergstrom spur area. So, yeah. So all of this to say that there's a huge need for grassroots advocacy still. (laughs) So give your pitch on Austin outside and, and again, how you are as an organization trying to advocate uh, and get people engaged both at the individual level and also the organizational level. Uh, sure. Well, public interest advocacy doesn't stop, uh, and uh, the rep- that its representation through the coalition called Austin Outside is in the uh, greater Austin area. I would call it the gro- Austin region. The growth is happening uh, as fast as pretty much any place in the country. Population growth is happening. Uh, to have a collective voice to say what parts of our land base, not just within the city limits, but within the metropolitan region, uh, should remain unbuilt and protected for public access is is a continuing message that Austin Outside will be the collective voice of, hopefully in a louder and louder, respectfully, but loud (laughs) way. And, and uh, the result will be beneficial to everybody. That is, the economy will respond positively to protecting special places and, and developing an active transportation network to connect those special places along with uh, individual citizens just using and liking them. Yeah. And yes, for those uh, tuning in, if you are here in the Austin area, uh, it, it is a membership organization. So please, uh, you know, click on that link. Again, uh, the links will be in the show notes and in the video description below. Engage, get, uh, you know, get involved if you can. And uh, if if time is, is, is a, you know, is an issue and you're, you're not able to do, you know, give time, you can give money. Oh, thank you. Much, John, and let me just put a fine point on that. We're a, Austin Outside is a membership uh, a coalition of organizations, so the members are actually organizations, but supporters uh, can donate, and that donate button, if, if you represent a, an organization of any sort that appreciates active transportation, uh, active transportation and open space, uh, it's easy to join as a member organization. But also you can become an Austin outsider, as we've just started to call our individual uh, supporters who donate. And you can get there through the donate button. Thanks. And, and I am a proud donor. So I'm one of the Austin outsiders uh, as, as an individual uh, here in the area. I don't do much in, in, in locally in terms of uh, advocacy work and, and activism, uh, but I, I love to profile the, the positive really advances that we have been seeing. And uh, it's, it's my honor and, and pleasure to be able to, to donate to the, to, the, uh, to the organization. But what I really love doing is profiling the success. And I want to pull up this. This is the interactive uh, trails and, and uh, the proposed tri- uh, urban trail network. Uh, this is a really, really cool feature that's out on the, the Austin uh, website here in the Urban Trails program, and this is a, a an, an ArcGIS uh, map. <laughs> 
you've got to be, you've got to be just grinning ear to ear, you know, every single year these days uh, with the the build out of of this urban trail network. Well, with the modern technology, it describes the aspiration that was uh, not originated in the early '90s, but uh, it was articulated in the early 90s, literally by one Trust for Public Land intern riding the 30 miles of uh, trails that existed at the time on his bike and then drawing them out by hand. He was a geography student at UT, so he had that that skill. Uh, but now we've got uh, GIS and we've got not just that 400-mile aspirational network of trails uh, in these yellow and happily some blue lines means they have been uh, created uh, and are usable. But uh, we've got a larger, you know, the whole SMA, the whole metropolitan area will eventually be encompassed by this kind of planning. And uh, hope we'll start to get the money to fund them too. Now, I'm kind of zeroing in on this for a reason, um, if I can get it to focus in on what I wanted to focus in on. Uh, when Ivy and I were, were talking, uh, Ivy, again, is the executive director of the Shoal Creek Conservancy. And off to the left here, you can sort of see the uh, relatively solid side of the trail network, on uh, which you know really creates that, that uh, western edge of the, the loop. What's, what's that loop called again? Uh, thanks, John. The Big Loop. The Big Loop, yeah. A combination of the Shoal Creek Trail, the Waller Creek Trail, and the Lance Armstrong Bikeway, as well as the um, Trail Conservancy's Butler Trail along the south side. That 30 plus mile loop uh, would uh, represent the bulk of the urban core of Austin. And it's. Uh, Funding of its creation is exists now with the passage of 2020 bond, um, and uh, so we'll see more of this in blue um, as as the next couple or three years get its projects completed. Yeah, yeah, and and Ivy and I had talked about the fact that yes, uh, some of it is natural surface trail and some of it is a uh, paved trail. Some of it is off street network and some of it's on street network, uh, especially in the case of like the Shoal Creek Boulevard protected bikeway. But the the goal is for it to be an inviting, a safe and inviting environment for all ages and abilities. Yeah, and the big big loop is a. Uh is a major project. There are several others, like you've mentioned, the, uh, you had the Great Springs project uh, on, and there's the Violet Crown Trail. We've got a, a handful of big uh, elements of what will be a metropolitan-wide, primarily creek-based, interconnected, active transportation system for the citizens of Austin and the Central Texas region. It's a pretty exciting project to have worked on and to continue to be uh, a worker on. Yeah, yeah. Now, you mentioned the Violet Crown Trail. is Now, as I understand, part of that is also going to be part of the Great Springs network. Isn't that correct? Isn't it sort of the, the this section of it? Yes. Uh, Violet Crown Trail starts at Barton Springs and goes... Uh, upstream along Barton Creek, but then uh, around and ultimately down to uh, Hayes County in San Marcos. That that 30 mile trail uh, called the Violet Crown because the western part of the city at sunset often looks like a violet crown. Uh, I wondered about that name. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm pretty sure. Oh, Henry actually wrote about it when he was an Austinite uh, more than 100 years ago. That's where that name comes from. In any case, uh, the Violet Crown Trail will be a component of the Great Springs series of trails connecting the Great Springs of Central Texas. Fantastic. Yeah, and uh, and parts of the, the Violet Crown, uh, of course, are uh, uh, un 
uh, unpaved, you know, natural surface trails and parts of it uh, are, are also paved uh, pathways and urban, sort of in the vernacular of uh, Austin, the city of Austin, the, or the urban trail um, concept. So good stuff. Ted, um, is there anything that we haven't yet covered that you want to make sure that we uh, talk about here today? Uh, yeah. Well, thanks for asking. I, it feels like we've covered uh, a whole bunch. I, I would just uh, encourage anybody that's watching to uh, don't wait for somebody to give you permission. If you're if you have an aspiration in this area or any other area that's not an organized uh, effort yet, go ahead and take a take a first step. Public interest advocacy is uh, really enjoyable once you get in, into it. So I would I would just offer that. And I love that too. I mean, this is really advice, you know, guidance that anybody can use regardless of where they're at. Your situation may be a little bit different, you know, wherever you might be uh, around the world, but more than likely there are needs <laughs> within your org- within your uh, community uh, that you can, you know, pull together uh, individually as a group and, um, and you know, do what you can to make your you know community a safer, more inviting place, and uh, you know, create a culture of activity, create an active town, create an active outside, uh, like the Austin Outside Coalition of Organizations has done. Uh, Ted Siff, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so very much. Thank you. It's my, been my pleasure. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Ted Siff with the Austin Outside Organization. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, (laughs) leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, it'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, Just hit the subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell next to it so that you can customize your notification preferences. And next week, I have two live streaming events on Wednesday, the 21st. I have Ryan Van Duzer joining me once again for the annual holiday celebration. And he will be sharing some information about his new book that he has just published, uh, which is coming out, I believe, the day before on the 20th. (laughs) And then on Friday, the 23rd, I am honored to have uh, Mayor John Botters from Emeryville, uh, California, joining me for the season ending uh, blowout live streaming event. So please join me for both of those live streaming uh, episodes. And uh, hey, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity health, and happiness. Cheers. Hey, also want to send a very special thank you to all my amazing Active Towns ambassadors uh, out there who are directly supporting my efforts through Patreon, uh, Buy Me a Coffee, the YouTube Super Thanks, uh, as well as purchases from the Active Town store and making donations to the nonprofit. Uh, I simply could not do this without you. So again, thank you so very much.